This is Cashflow Ninja, episode 33 with David Sowell. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Now, here is your host, MC Laubscher. Hello everyone, MC Lobsher and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a very interesting show for you today. You know, I try to do my very best to bring remarkable guests on the show every week to share different ideas and ideas of how to create income streams in this new global economy. And I must say, I think after today's show, you're going to look differently at a cup of coffee. It's been extremely interesting researching and preparing for today's show and interview. About 83% of adults drink coffee in the United States, the world's biggest consumer of the beverage, and coffee is the second most traded commodity in the world after oil. Coffee is a $90 billion industry annually, second only to oil in terms of dollar volume traded. Today's guest will share with you how to create a sustainable income stream from coffee farms in Panama. Coffee is a proven product with sustainable and growing demand and limited and declining supply worldwide. You can own the land and appreciating real hard asset, safe and secure, private and offshore. Your coffee farm parcels are professionally operated for you by a very experienced management team. You can also earn a sustainable long-term offshore income with really nice returns. So this investment really plays well into international diversification strategies where you plant multiple flags in different countries. As a previous guest, Jeff Berwick from the Dollar Vigilante discussed on episode 27. For those of you interested in privacy and less government involvement in your life and finances, another very significant reason to consider this unique opportunity carefully also is when you own a farm parcel on one of these coffee farms, it's only one of two ways to own assets that currently does not require reporting them to the U.S. government. So international real estate in your name is currently not reportable under the FBAR or FATCA regulations. My guest today is David Sewell, the Managing Director of International Coffee Farms. David is a Canadian and has lived, worked, and invested in Latin America since 1989. While educated and traveled, David joined the Royal Canadian Navy in 1968 and served for 12 years as a shipboard officer. He holds an MBA in finance and a BSc in biology and has been licensed as a realtor and stockbroker. With an extensive business background in venture capital and offshore private wealth management, David provides a diverse portfolio of international expertise to anyone interested in offshore real estate investing. Before we are joined by David, just a reminder that you can download any book for free when you try Audible for 30 days. You can grab your free trial and audio book download at cashflowninja.com forward slash free book download. And my friend Minish Bindi from Gold Silver for Life is hosting a webinar, Three Steps to Cashflow Gold and Silver. Minesh is showing people how to use their gold and silver holdings to create income streams. You can register for the webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash Gold Silver Webinar. All of our past shows and show notes are available at CashflowNinja.com, and you can also join our community and mailing list by texting the word Cashflow Ninja, one word, all capitalized, to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. If you sign up to join our community, I will email you three of the top 10 books ever written on building wealth. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to the Cashflow Ninja Podcast with your host, MC Lobsher. You must be prepared to ignite. David, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, MC. Pleased to be here. Can you please share a little bit about your background and your journey and how you ended up in Panama and co-founded International Coffee Farms? Sure can. I'm Canadian, and I left uh, the... Great White North in 1989 for two reasons. 
as I speak at investment conferences, and I tell people that I mean, it was interested then and still now in warmer weather and lower taxes. And I found both of those by going offshore from Canada, of course, ended up originally in the United States in Southern California, which was interestingly enough a tax haven compared to the marginal tax rates in Canada in 1989, which were 52%. Um, kept on going from there through Costa Rica, uh, Mexico in the next 10, 12 years. Uh, made a trip to Argentina for three weeks, really liked it and stayed for a year and a half but found out that uh, I'd overcorrected and they had snow. So I came back up north and then landed in uh, Panama, and my wife and I and our two cats have been here for 10 years. Now, you started the company in, in Colombia and implemented the same business model in Panama. Can you please tell us about your international coffee farms and what service and value you provide to the marketplace? Sure. What we did is we um, I was consulting at the time, to a group of people in Colombia that had some coffee farms and wanted to do a private placement uh, offering to raise capital for their company. The structure of the offering wasn't appropriate and wouldn't work for me. My background is venture capital and have been doing private placements uh, for 25 years. It just wouldn't work. So we sat down and collaboratively wrote in a, uh, this business model that uh, came up from the investor's point of view to be able to provide a, a you know, certain features and advantages and benefits that investors we thought would be looking for. Turned out to be wildly successful quickly, and it included having offshore hard assets that people could diversify their portfolios into that weren't correlated with the stock market, had to do with uh, passive income, so it needed to be turnkey managed for you offshore, um, it had to have um, a reasonably decent income, but nothing uh, crazy but sustainable income from the offshore agricultural sector, which is a hot sector these days and should be because of the growing population in the world and the lack of distribution, effective distribution for food, so high demand in a proven product. So we weren't going to do anything perishable or anything that we had to reinvent the wheel on, coffee being the second largest traded commodity in the world only behind oil in dollar terms, it was a pretty well a slam dunk that coffee is a proven product. So we had all of those things on our Ben Franklin sheet, of, our closing sheet for ourselves, ticked all those off, added social sustainability to the program, which is extremely important in supporting and, and improving the lives of the coffee farm workers that work for us. And, and I mean, collectively for us, for the owners of the parcels, ourselves and everybody else, they're the people that grow the coffee that we sell that make the profits. So the social sustainability part is very important. So the whole group of benefits together added up to a company that would convert underperforming commercial coffee farms into well-run, state-of-the-art specialty coffee farms. That's the stuff you pay 15, 20, 25 bucks, 40 bucks a pound for in the store. That's the part of the market that uh, represents 20% of a 90 billion, with a B, market in coffee alone. 20% of that market is specialty coffee, and it's growing at 16% a year. So that's way the, the why of why we're doing this. Now, you had mentioned social sustainability, and one of the values and principles, obviously, that you built your organization on. Can you talk about the three pillars, which one is the social. Can you talk about the other pillars of sustainability that you have identified? Sure. Like any table, you need three legs to have it stable, or at least. Be, right. You know, fall over. You can do it on others, but three is better. Economic, of course, is the, the leading factor. You, you need economic sustainability. You have to make money or you just can't stay around. You need capital to invest in the beginning, and this is fairly capital intensive. By the time you acquire the farm, spend three or four years of turning those farms around before there's any really significant cash flow from the specialty coffee. We could sell the coffee we acquired early um, as commercial coffee, but that's a that's a no go. It's a non starter because the, the coffee market is so um, variable. It's uh, up and down from in the last two years alone, from three dollars a pound to a dollar a pound, and it costs a dollar sixty to make it. So. Often it's just not economically viable to be in the commercial coffee business, but economic viability with those numbers being in specialty coffee is there. And it's important that you have that economic leg on your table, otherwise you're not, you're going to go away. 
Secondly, of course, and lots of people talk about it, uh, is uh, being green, which is simply environmental sustainability. Leave what you found in better shape than what you got it. And that should more or less solve the, the issue of uh, environmental sustainability. Treat it properly. Leave it for the people in the future in better shape than you found it. And then finally, social sustainability, which is often missed out in many, many business plans where people pay either pay lip service to or do not recognize the fact that the, uh, there are an awful lot of people in the, in the chain of events that make this happen. And we consider the everybody from our general manager, um, a sophisticated engineer, 30 years in the business, right through our man the door, which is Spanish for our farm foreman, um, and a, a, a qualified agricultural engineer and an agronomist, all the way down to the youngest 17, 18-year-old native Indian farm hand working on our farms is integral to the process, and everybody's involved in that social sustainability program. We take 20% that is not to be violated away from the gross operating income. We take our revenues from our farm, less our direct operating expenses, and come up with a gross operating income number, and we take it from the top line. We take 20% of that, put it to the side, and that is for the people. That is for the bonuses. That is for the higher wages that we pay from get from the get go. That's for the accommodations we provide for them. That's for flush toilets and uh, showers and laundry washing facilities and roofs that don't leak and electricity and floors that don't have bugs crawling up through the holes in them. Better working conditions, um, sometimes shorter hours, better clothing to wear, much more. Uh, high-tech equipment to use so their job is easier. All of that's rolled up into the 20%, which comes out first. From there, we split 80-20 with the investors. Now, the value that you and your company provide and offer is a business model with a proof of concept and an established experience, a local team to implement and execute this model and plan. Can you provide some insights on how you implement the strategy after you acquire a new farm? Sure can. The critical thing to do, the most important, the one thing, there's a good book out there called that. The one thing that's Love that book. Yeah, very important in the coffee farming business is after we acquire the farm is to immediately take possession of the farm. We may do a deal where there's some terms and conditions where we're going to hold back some funds based on finding the right boundaries for the territory, for the farm, or various other conditions here and there that are particular to coffee farming. But in general, we take over the farm immediately because most farms that we're buying are owned by older gentlemen, you know, and I mean 80, 85, 90 plus gentlemen that have been in the farming business forever, but they know that they're not going to be able to continue because the kids are not interested. They're gone to Miami or Panama City or wherever and they're doing their thing, and they're not interested in digging in the dirt and growing coffee anymore. The millennials are the millennials, and that's that's not in their game plan. Um, but the money is. So the, right. the fathers know, the patriarch knows that the farm is going to be sold. Hence, he doesn't really invest a lot of money in the farm in the last few years before he's going to do that. Tendency to have the farms being quite a bit older, the trees being quite a bit older than we would consider optimal, because they don't maintain their farms particularly well. They take what God gives them every year, sell that to one one buyer, put the cash in their pocket, and wait for the next harvest. It's not a sustainable model for us who are developing um, a legacy investment for people here that can go on forever and ever and ever. So we take over the farm very quickly so that we can feed the trees, we can fertilize the trees, we can combat the bugs, we can combat the rust, and these things are easily to handleable if you get on them. But if you don't get on them, they go quickly, and they can really destroy a farm in a hurry. So that's the biggest thing that we do is we provide the capital quickly to grab a hold of this less than well-maintained, a little bit underloved, and definitely undercapitalized farm so that we can make the best of this coffee farm as quickly as we can. What's the long-term goal for your company and your vision for international coffee farms? Well, we're going to acquire as many farms as we can get our hands on. So we're constantly in the acquisition mode. We did five in the first 
15 months, we acquired five full farms. And we are in the process of acquiring four more at the same time right now. We'll, we'll, we'll stage them a little bit. But where our acquisition speed is ramping up, because we've got a reputation now of doing what we said we're going to do, when we're going to do it, we, we negotiate a fair and reasonable price with a willing buyer, that's us, and a willing seller. And uh, we close and we do what we say we do. We live in a small town. Rumor mill is crazy. Um, so you got to produce and, and, and deliver on what you promise. And we're doing that so farms are being offered to us more frequently in the right locations at the right prices. And we're acquiring as many of those farms as we can, as quickly as we can. Happy to say we can't keep up with the demand from in individual people who would like to be an owner of a parcel. And we generally have more par people in line with their contract in place and their funds in place, then we have farms. We acquire the farms, we allocate people from the enrollment queue backwards into those farms, and often we'll fill up a farm the same day we um, acquire it. So it's best for people who are interested to get into the line and uh, they'll be allocated into a farm as soon as we get it in the order they fund. And so we want to acquire as many farms as we can. The idea is to provide very long-term passive incomes. Coffee's coffee. It's not going away anytime soon. It's growing rapidly. Specialty coffee is, is a, cr a craze. It's not a boom and bust kind of philosophy. Um, coffee's been around for 5,000 years, and in all these countries where we live, four or 500 years of the economy has been based on coffee. So we're into that business model where we're going to provide very long-term passive income for patient people um, who, who can turn this into a legacy investment. Invest young and keep it for themselves forever. Invest old and give it to your kids. And if you don't like it, your kids, give it to somebody else. And so that's, so those are the goals with uh, to be able to provide a perpetual offshore hard asset that has an income attached to it. Let's get into some of the details for my listeners that's, that's interested in this. How do people get to participate in this invest, investment and what's your investor profile? Well, the investor profile is something different to me, frankly. Um, I've been in the venture capital business for 25 or 30 years. And generally, the, in those days, the average investor was 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, had accumulated some capital, and was male, professional. Now, we run the gamut from, I think, as young as 21 years old, that has invested in this long-term investment, um, from the, still to the same people that are 80 we have a gentleman that's 93 that's in the uh, that's an owner of parcels, obviously for his children and everywhere in between. Strong, one very strong demographic is women um, who had not been a major source of clients for me over the last 25 or 30 years. Um, they like the social sustainability part of this program a lot, I believe, and so we have a profile across the board: men and women, young medium and old, professional and becoming professional, people with small amounts of money, large amounts of money, people putting in one or two parcels to get their toe wet to see what we're really like, coming down on a tour, checking us out and adding significantly more to their portfolio, people that are just starting out in their investment career and their millennials that don't have large amounts of available capital because they're building families and other things that take money and they come in for one parcel and and uh, we'll be building over their lifetime. Uh, we purposely kept the price low per parcel so that we could attract as many people to the opportunity so we can help teach them um, offshore investing, the advantages of portfolio diversification, non-correlation to the stock market, planting five flags outside of the country for various reasons, et cetera, et cetera. So that's our profile. To participate in the investment is quite simple. You go to the website, which is www.internationalcoffeefarms.com, and all the information's there. There's videos. There's all kinds of articles and stuff where you can bone up on what's going on in the coffee business if you don't already spend four dollars a day at Starbucks and, and, and measure the measure the line outside the door every morning and around the block, and they have three stores in every corner. So the research on the on the product's not too hard to do. You go through, right. through the site, it explains who we are, what we do, how we do it. And at the end of the day, you get to a getting started button and click on there. It's a landing page. You put in your information, send it to us. Automatically, you'll receive an email that explains in detail what the program is, 
and you get a 16 page full color brochure on, uh, in, um, how an op- a coffee farm operates in Panama, how, to, how to own your own parcel of a coffee farm in Panama, which is simply a frequently asked questions book answering all, almost all the questions we've been asked hundreds of times by quite a few hundred investors. So you, you get all that, no commitment whatsoever. You make your mind up if you want to participate or not. If you have more questions, you communicate with us and we'll get back to you um, uh, with your answers. Uh, we, we probably will never call you. Um, we don't solicit your business. If you are interested, give us a shout. Uh, and like I said, we're always oversubscribed. Yeah, there's some fantastic information available in that. I downloaded that in my research for our chat today. So um, I will highly encourage all of our listeners, if you're interested in that, to get that information. Let's look at the income stream that you create for investors. How long from funding the investment until an investor will start to receive cash flow from this investment? Depends when you invest uh, vis-a-vis the timing of the harvest. We only harvest once a year. We have a mixture of farms of high altitude and low altitude, so we're we're harvesting low altitude farms from around September until December, and then we're harvesting the high altitude farms from January through March or April. Depending when you join, the standard answer is you should expect cash flow within 12 to 15 months of when you are uh, funded and allocated into a farm. So that's the standard answer. Could be shorter depending on when you join up based on the harvest could be a little longer depending on how long it takes us to get a farm, but you can count on somewhere between 12 and 15 months for the initial returns. The farms take about three years to turn them around from an underloved, undercapitalized, undermanaged commercial coffee farm into a specialty coffee farm that's full of love. And that time there's cash flow in there, but it's not really the reason you're investing. It's low, small amounts, of cash flow, but that cash flow builds very rapidly after those three years of the turnaround process are in place and will hit double digit figures annually quickly and high double digit figures. And I'm saying I'm talking 20 and 30 percent a year uh, as time goes on. So this is a patient investment, long term, long term hold um, with some cash flow to start with, significant cash flow for many, many years once the turnaround is complete. And at the moment, we have an average annual return forecast of around 12% annually. You also host farm tours for prospective investors at some stage. How frequently do you have these tours? And where can my listeners receive more information on these tours? Again, the information is on the website. So there's a farm tours button. You can go there and get all the information you need from there. Uh, we hold group tours currently about three times a year. We have the next one is in July 29th to 31st of this year. Then we have another one scheduled for just before Thanksgiving in November with the exact date to be determined. Uh, there'll be another one after the new year. But three to four group tours a year, they're fun because you get to come alongside a dozen or so other like-minded people. Um, most of the people bond amongst themselves quite strongly when they're on the tour. And we also teach you a heck of a lot about coffee. Um, there's no charge for that tour. You get yourself here. We'll host you for the first night in the hotel. We'll host you for the weekend for your meals and drinks and transportation. We'll show you all of our farms. We'll take you to a professional cupping lab, which we're building our own right now and show you how to cup and grade coffee. What's all the, what's all the hubbub behind specialty coffee? what really is specialty coffee, how we grow it, how we pick it, how we process it. You'll be able to see our brand new coffee processing mill, which we're in the process of constructing right now, which is called a Beneficio in Spanish. You'll have some fun for, at dinners and drinks in the evening, meet some cool people, and it's a fun weekend for three days. If you're interested in real estate around here, then we can also introduce you to uh, a real estate brokerage firm that will take you out and show you the opportunity to possibly buy a second home we can also help you out on those tours in advance and during the during the time you're here with um, friendly nations visas and second passports and bank accounts and you know various other things that our boots on the ground experience over the last 10 years can you can take advantage of and having said all that those are the formal kinds of things but if you're ever in in country and you're here on a vacation and you want to come and see us we'll take we'll be happy to take anybody on an individual coffee farm tour for the day. 
Fantastic. Now, uh, one thing that you spoke about earlier and touched upon was just planting d- uh, flags in five different flags in different countries and the whole idea of international diversification. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Sure. We obviously offer an offshore hard asset. You know, so there are you know, a significant number of people and, and should be as, as many people as possible trying to diversify their portfolios away from paper into hard assets, whether that be gold, which I consider money as opposed to an investment, or uh, other hard assets offshore. But agricultural property is pretty good. You know, they're not making a whole lot more land, and we're running short of food. So having an, an ag offshore hard asset is a, a way to diversify your investment portfolio away from manipulated paper um, in the stock markets where you have zero control into something where you do have a deeded interest in a piece of land. It's not going anywhere. That is a, is a very nice flag to plant. Going along with that, um, there are numerous people that think that things might not all go well in the United States or Canada or other countries, and we're seeing a lot of that nowadays with offshore uh, terrorism and, 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 and problems developing in, in first world countries. Some people think that having a um, prepackaged visa that allows you permanent residency in another country that you might need to use is a good idea. Um, some people just want it so they can come here and hang out for three or four months and don't have to go across the border to renew their passport. In other words, they're invited guests, they're permanent, they have a legal reason to be here, and it's, it's cool. It's a nice way to go. It does lead to a passport down the road if you decide that you want another passport. That also has some advantages to certain people. We have a lot of experience here with real estate agents and who's good and who's not, and which houses are priced right, which aren't, and, and lawyers that can do the job and lawyers that can't do the job, and, and uh, banks that are difficult to deal with and banks that are less difficult to deal with. None of them are easy to deal with, but there are some that are less difficult, so we can point you into a place to put a, you know, open a bank account at the appropriate time. You can put your distributions from the coffee farms into there. Um, so there's lots of things we can do that we can help as a result of having boots, boots on the ground. No, thank you for sharing that. I, it's ex- extremely important. Obviously, growing up in South Africa, I understand the importance of this international diversification. And if we just look around the world and what's happened just in the neighboring country in, in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and then obviously now in Venezuela, but as well in first world countries too. So Definitely a very, very crucial part of an overall uh, just a diversification strategy. Now, David, um, I love your philosophical approach to investing and business and some of the values and principles that you've built your company on. And a question that I ask all of my guests um, just is, if you cannot pass on any money to your children and grandchildren, you were only allowed on to pass five principles to them to build wealth, um, achieve success and happiness, and for future generations, what would they be? That's a large list. <laughs> <laughs> I have three kids and seven grandkids so far. I would think that, I don't know if there's five specific ones, but I think that the most important one is to develop yourself personally. I'm fairly tuned into the spiritual world. I'm not into material things particularly. I spend quite a time, a bit of time being introspective, talking to myself about myself and how I'm going to improve myself. And I don't often share that with many people on how I'm going to do that or what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do it. I strongly believe in a saying that says the there is no try. I'm not going to try to do anything. Do it or don't do it. I don't like people telling me they're going to try to do something because there's really no commitment there. So I think committing to yourself, to your own personal development over the years. It doesn't happen overnight. Many, many, many years of personal development, reading widely, listening to other audio texts and people telling you things about how they've done it. But not trying to be a better person, but just do be a better person. Practically, you can quickly, as quickly as you can, Read Kiyosaki's books and, and, and get out of making money for somebody else. Stop earning money for somebody else and start earning it for yourself as soon as you possibly can. Easier said than done. Young people, marriages, kids, houses, mortgages, 
but it can be done. So do it and do it now. Develop yourself, make the money for yourself. That's what I, that's what I think is key to having a fun 50 years. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. And David, thank you so much for coming on our show and just sharing your knowledge and your journey and providing so much value for my listeners. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining me and my guest, David Sorrell, Managing Director of International Coffee Farms. Please remember to grab your free audiobook download from Audible. You can download any book for free when you try Audible for 30 days. You can grab your free trial and audiobook download at cashflowninja.com forward slash free book download. And just a reminder to sign up for the free webinar hosted by my friend Manish Bindi from Gold Silver for Life, Three Steps to Cash Flow Gold and Silver. Manish is showing people how to use their gold and silver holdings to create income streams. You can register for the webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash gold silver webinar. All of our past shows and show notes are available at cashflowninja.com. And you can join our community and mailing list by texting the word Cashflow Ninja. One word, all capitalized, 244222. That's two fours and three twos. If you sign up to join our community, I will email you three of the top 10 books ever written on building wealth. As always, guys, if there's any way that I can provide more value to you and serve you better, please go to our contact page and send me an email or leave me a voicemail on our SpeakPipe voicemail line. That's our show for today, everyone. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. You have been listening to the Cash Flow Ninja with your host, MC Laubscher, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Today's show notes and resources are available on our website, CashflowNinja.com. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objective, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.